welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Regeneration Podcast. I think, did you think we ran away? Yeah. No, we were just in a little I hike. thought I ran away for a second there, yeah. Mike ran away. Mike doesn't return my calls. No, but Mike, where, where the heck were you? You know, I, I don't think it's anything too much more complicated than the, the big one was that my uh, youngest daughter got married. So we had a lot of visitors. Um, I was I was working more this summer than previous summers. My garden's out of control. Uh, we have other things like just a lot of family events in August. I want to tell our listeners if they want to plan ahead for like three or four years, which I think most do, is that I'm thinking like next August, too, we'll just kind of catch this catch pan with things. Maybe like second half of July and August. And uh, I hope people always know we're coming back. Well, yeah, my my publisher disappears at the end of June. He doesn't come back, get back to the office till. Yeah, don't we all need that? You know, what we'll read is Tom's to her poems on feast days. We'll just call it a feast. Well, that's. And... I don't know if you noticed though, Mike. I started. I started on my my YouTube channel. I started doing like short videos on poets and stuff. I think it's great. You did one yeah, on I'm house do, I'm do Thomas Turhern because I don't okay, have good. one in Thomas Turhern. I don't. Do I? Yeah. No, I do have. I have a couple in Thomas Turhern, so I won't, I'll skip him. He's a he's I a don't. real amazing person. Like if you, which you were, in your lifetime, they discovered more Turhern writings. Am I correct? Um, they in a dumpster. In them. a dumpster. Yeah. In dumpsters in a yeah, which is really cool. If you had a, a writer you love so much, and they, they just discovered actually, one of them. I think more was stuff. In Canada. They were about to burn a bunch of stuff. You know, like it's, it's somebody had all this junk in his house and they're going to burn it all. And they go, hey, this looks kind of interesting. And it was Traherne. It was an und- undiscovered Traherne man. Yeah, right. And that was maybe in the 60s. Okay. I but, thought there was even some stuff in the 80s, to be honest. No, there's there there might be. I can't remember. I wrote about it. I forgot about it. But, but yeah. well, his whole career, I mean, nobody knew about him really until the late like the turn of the 19th 20th century he's kind of a something like of a forerunner to christian romanticism wouldn't you say oh yeah oh yeah our 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 topic today christian romanticism and as mike knows and as everybody as you might know i recently wrote uh, a sub stack on the druid stairs back on christian romanticism which is kind of like one of my go back my return to themes through life it is give a give people i read it um give people the basic thesis of what you're going at in this one um i want to talk about the role of church at some point in this and it's not it's not a divergence go ahead well because i write about it in the submerged reality Hmm. i it's it's also i I, there's a section on it in uh the the name of that book the heavenly country and and so and let me shut this door because my kids are loud but uh (laughs) <laughs> that was my i'm sorry my research assistants are loud uh so so with, this goes back for me uh, it, it actually if you think also about it with uh owen barfield and huge his, for me he'll be his, the central figure in my thinking and, well his book this, Romanticism comes of age and for him and th- and that wrote about this is basically and, I, and actually I didn't read his book Romanticism Come, Comes of Age until after I wrote The Submerged Reality, and in The Submerged Reality, I argued you know, on and I, I want I'm gonna, I'm going to adjust that <laughs> I'm going to change my argument here. Uh, I argued about the noble failure of Romanticism, which I'm still sticking by that. Agreed. Uh, and but. I just don't think it's done. That's that, that's where I think I have to modify. Because it's the only theory. direction still to go, right? It's it a, is uh, the only direction still yeah, to go. Yeah, yeah. Have you read and the book by right. R.J. Riley called Romantic Religion, which is on, it's using, it's focusing, a really great book. Um, R.J. Riley, Romantic Religion, but it's using the inklings, but focusing, which none of them do, focus as it has to do on Barfield as kind of yeah. the key one, right? Yes, and I think, I think the inklings were definitely doing uh, Christian romanticism for sure mm-hmm. um but but so I've been really you know especially over the course of the last four years when things got so bizarre with I have no reason to know what you're talking about church. just kidding. yeah with the yeah <laughs> don't, don't, <laughs> don't hit us with another don't cancel this one uh but but I, th- I this is where I had to rethink my position on Christian romanticism because um 
part of what I argued in the submerged reality is that part of what how they the the romantics the original romantics failed is that they didn't have an institution or tradition in which to ground their hopes. Fair enough. Yeah. And so it kind of atrophied, kind of died on the vine because of that, right? Mm-hmm. And I thought in that at the time I thought, and this is actually kind of the thesis of the submerged reality, is that sophiology is a kind of Christian romanticism, absolutely. Right, right, right. And that that I thought and I still think could offer <laughs> a way out <laughs> for for the institutional churches, right? But maybe that's exactly what sophiology is. Not like it seems like your the, your tone of voice is trying to say maybe it could serve, but you know maybe it's it's the real dealio. That's yeah. that's always what was meant to happen. But then I was blessed in my my ponderings and my my musings by our guest today, Lindsay Rose. Such a pretty name, yeah, Lindsay Rose. Thank you. And because I met Lindsay through Twitter. That's where we, that's where we meet people now. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, can't, I can't just bump into people. I have to find them through electronic means. Um, and what? So Lindsay is a thinker, and she actually has a the, the inaugural essay in the forthcoming Jesus the Imagination on um, the household of things. And you know, the more I found out about Lindsay, the more I liked, and the more I felt we were, you know, in in the words of. Um, What's her name? Anna Brinke. Anna Brinke. Yeah. We're kindred spirits. <laughs> I didn't know that was a uh, an Anne of Green Gables. Oh, yeah. And, and because because also to quote Anne of Green Gables, Lindsay has scope for imagination. <laughs> and a few now, if you know, now, have you read Anne of Green Gables, Mike? I have not. My wife has read about 8,000 times. Yes, because it's worth reading 8,000 times. And there's all these new versions coming out, right, that push in different suck. directions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They suck. They suck. They, suck. they, they, they suck. really suck. They suck. But the original one, especially the first book, I mean, I when I was teaching uh, college, I was, and I was teaching, I don't know why, that, because I had been a Waldorf teacher. They thought I, I, I gave a shit about education. Um, but they asked me to teach a course on how to teach te- uh, for teachers because I have done a lot of teacher training in my day. And I made them read Anne of Green Gables because I told them this is the only teaching manual you need because Lucy Maud Montgomery, the author, was a school teacher in a little school, just like the school that Anne attends in. in and I've seen enough of the videos and redos to, you know, to capture what you're saying. You know, even those don't totally distort the education model there. And she, Lucy Montgomery, uh, used romanticism to teach children of that age, right? Especially middle school kids, because that's where they are. And it's killing, and I think it's killing education, not just education, but but humanity. The, the actually, the absolute dearth of imagination and of, and of idealism that used to be there. I mean, I tell my my college students, <laughs> I was kind of a dorky kid, right? So when I, you know, when I started to like girls when I was in eighth or ninth grade, I never thought they should just put out. I had to earn the <laughs> love. You know what I mean? I felt that I had to write poetry for them or something. And the girls in the class right now, and I tell them they're like, that's cute, Dr. Martin, but wake up, um, <laughs> which is sad, right? And Kale yeah, Zeldin, I don't know if you guys know Kale. Yeah, I see my other guy chat podcast a lot. Yeah. And but Kale, he teaches ninth grade. I mean, he teaches high school, but he teaches uh, Romeo and Juliet to ninth graders. Mm-hmm. And he said they just don't believe that love is possible anymore. Oh, totally. I can verify that yeah. from thousands of gatherings at colleges. You know, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's just it's not a thing. I, um, one person said. The close, like the idea of like selfless love. I was one student um, in a philosophy club meeting of about 30. The closest way he could get at it of like some aspect of love. And I don't think it was just romantic love, but it was, again, if he could re-experience the love of learning a certain video game, right? That Mm -hmm. was just, if he had to be nostalgic and wistful 
and um, Heck, man. remembering love. It would be like, oh, if I could have that falling experience. I could play I when Donkey I, Kong again. Yeah, when I was getting into Skyrim. <laughs> yeah, it was really crazy. Yeah. I, was, I was really shocked in that venue. Shoot me now. Um, it happened so fast. It was total, this wash So, So, yeah. So, anyway, so encounter meeting Lindsay for me in a kind of you know her posts on Twitter are just inspiring I'm gonna, I, how come I don't follow I'm gonna follow you now go ahead she's keep talking. cagey that's why um but but Lindsay in, in addition to being a fine writer is really a gifted artist and what's, <laughs> what's the name of your sub stack do you have by the way Twitter's Twitter? called X now folks X. I know right it's so many different uh symbols as we can pull from that yeah. Um, my my sub stack, which is still forthcoming, being worked on, is noetic fairy tales. Noetic fairy tales. I like noetic yeah. fairy tales. So, and uh, you you shared with me uh the beautiful illustration you did with the with the girl and the fox. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That it was actually me playing with Martin Shaw's "The Fox Wife Dreaming" video that he did a few years ago. God, six years ago in the BC, or I think when he came and visited at one point, or maybe that was still for his MA program in the UK. But I, I, I love Martin Shaw, so that was kind yeah. of me playing around with some some of that imagery. I do yeah. dig that guy a lot. Yeah. Oh, I like him so much. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um. So so and Lindsay is you know, I'm an outer right here, is not. A, a card carrying member of any of the Christian churches, are you? Okay, I'm I'm hitting delete on this whole episode. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, That's so, too romantic for me. Yeah. I'm gonna use I'm gonna put the new symbol of Twitter all over the screen. Right, there you go, right? Yeah, yeah. But 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 Lindsay, I think Lindsay is what I have what from what I know of Lindsay, and I know I know a lot, but I I, I always want to know more. Is uh she has uh Christian romanticism embossed on her soul so what does it mean <laughs> to you Lindsay? what what does this term mean to well you? tell people about your background too because i don't really know Lindsay. oh my i mean i have i have gone i i consider myself like i've been seeking through all the churches all the different denominations i have visited protestants um i have gone through i almost at rci when i got put it with my daughter in 2013 oh. um i've listened to orthodoxy i have been deeply trying to find a place for my little noetic heart um, but my background um, is, it's not secular necessarily, but I grew up with a, with a father um, who was very interested in, in, in Eastern philosophy. So I grew up with a lot of like Vedanta and um, Shaivism and those types of very, very transcendent, um, you know, monistic uh, aesthetic kind of qualities. But a lot of, not so much Buddhism so much. And I grew up also, I went to like Waldorf preschools and things like that. I've taught in Waldorf wow. schools as well. Wow. Okay. Um, so I came through uh, to Rudolf Steiner probably in my 20s and um, became very invested in, you know, not sorts of theosophical stuff that my grandparents were into, but coming more into the, the anthroposophical and the idea of the soul and spirit. And, and you know, that I think Isis Mary Sophia was very um, transformative for me to read by Steiner when I was, mm -hmm. you know, in my early 20s. Um, but yeah, I, I, so I have, I have, I read too much. I have read. I I I have uh, in the last like, probably six seven years discovered like Neoplatonism, and that actually led me into the Orthodoxy and Catholicism just to see how the Western tradition kind of actually found itself. I'm also um you know a big fan of Peter Kingsley's work. Oh and, yeah, yeah. So and Michael, so, we haven't talked about it. I've read everything many times. So so good. It's yeah, like yeah. I I you know we got to do a show. Would would we ever get him on? He's so esoteric. Oh my god, I I adore his. I mean, and yeah. he's so like he you know has gone back to the Europe. He was in the U.S. for many years and such. Yeah. But the first thing I read by him was um, a story waiting to pierce you. Yeah, and it's really powerful. That, that, it really arrested me and just this idea of this um you know the the passing of tradition of of transformation of civilizations to be reborn in new ages was really like. It felt very. Uh, it's very. He's not me. a big fan of Steiner, but Michael he, in the no, story we're to Pierce Plato. You, yeah, no, right. But he's just saying um, that again, like the West, this kind of sui generis idea that the West just had the miracle of logic is crazy. Right. It comes from the East, right? Yeah, and um, and it comes from mysticism that the yeah. atromanticists that preceded Plato and so forth were these shamans who are buried in the mud. Uh, right. Empedocles and Parmenides, these were just shamans through and through. So it's like logic emanates out of. It's this whole Steinerian thing of original participation gives yes. rise to logic, right? And yeah. uh, it's it's a seminal, but he's coming at it from a different way. He's a pure Jungian. Um, so in that area, he's just, he can't get the Steinerian thing. 
Yeah. No, not at all. And I mean, and there are things I love about, you know, that I have contentions with, of course, but like yeah. um, to answer Michael's question though, Christian romanticism to me okay. is, um, is psychologically speaking, where I, the, the noble failure, as he's saying, occurs is that lack of pivot point between the imminent and transcendent. I know they try to do it aesthetically, but they didn't really, for as much as they want to embody it, it was very much an intellectual exercise, I feel. Um, I feel like there, this idea of sociology and Christian romanticism is about the pursuit of the divine for humanity. And so there's a very romantic notion of, of how to be embodied, how to be um, that pivot point for, I don't know, the, um, the spark in the soul that everyone actually carries and kind of seems to have forgotten about. Now, you've lost some of our listeners in a great way who heard Spark in the Soul and said, Gnostic, Gnostic. Well, yeah, you know, well, <laughs> speaking of the last time we talked, <laughs> remember we were talking about uh, Terrence Malick. With, yeah, yeah. It wasn't it was that long ago. It was two weeks ago. Can you believe it? Yeah, it seems like a million years ago. Yeah. But uh, when we talked, now, in Terrence Malick's film, uh, the, the Thin Red Line, for instance, there's a wonderful scene with... Uh, Sean Penn, who plays a, a sergeant, and Jim Caviezel, who's a private, who had been AWOL. And Caviezel saying, I've seen a different world, top, top, I've seen a yeah. different world. And he talks about the spark, right? Because this is Malik's drawing on, on this idea. And it's not only in Gnosticism, it's, Gnosticism, it's also in uh, Jakob Burma. Yeah. And, and he, 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 by and then Heidegger by way of Burma, even though Heidegger hides it. It's really there in Thomas Merton too, like the inward seat of yes. the soul. Yes, yes, it's it's, this, then, it's a it's a noose, right? It's the eye of yeah, the soul. It it's that it illumination is. of that sacred heart. You know, that's how I can. That's how I you know intend it. And, and you've been and rescued after, from heresy, Lindsay. After Caviezel's <laughs> character dies in that film, you know, Sean Penn's kind of a hard ass sergeant. He's looking at, you know, where they buried him. Where's your spark now? Right? right but the where the spark where is, is, is is where where beauty transcends the the dreadful conditions of the world right yeah. where there, there's a there, the splendor that the all things shining that comes through right it's the and glory I, right yeah the, yeah where the Sophia. Sophia and and this is what what I really see in in Lindsay's being and in, in what she writes and what she draws is he's, she's attentive to that which is encouraging to me you know so you know and uh, and the thing is i so uh, what did i write wrote, wrote that uh substack on alt christianity recently i saw that <laughs> which is uh because i i think it you know and then and this is where it's romantic right this is romanticism it's uh where you stop waiting for somebody else to do something about it <laughs> you know okay we'll we'll elect a new government and they'll fix it right now yeah. or i'll just go to a different church and i won't have the same i think this is uh and this is what speaking of romantics this is uh by the way i got a lot of shit from somebody this week what was it about about mention i uh, can't remember where it was and when maybe it was on somebody's comments on youtube that i did they go it was, if it was from body, it's because you probably didn't. Because I was talking about Goethe. Oh, okay. And he was saying, and Goethe, you know, I thought, because I used the, the end of Faust as a very sophiological image, right? Which it is. Yes. The Mater Gloriosa comes as God's emissary to forgive Faust for everything. Yeah. And so does Gretchen, who he he just, he treated so horribly. But she she forgives him. And it's this, which is, and it's funny because I know Catholic intellectuals, you know, like those uh, those pathos neurotics, right? They uh, <laughs> they you, they, they are I'm not anymore. They hate that Goethe has has Faust be forgiven. He needs to be punished. So they believe in hell. Apparently, they're not universalists, though Goethe was, right? Yeah. And it's the as Goethe says, right? It's the divine feminine who leads us ever onward. And but but so you know when people say Goethe wasn't a Christian, and I read him, and even in, if you read, uh, I can't remember it's the, it's the Sorrows of Bertha or it's one of his novels. Mm -hmm. He's got this whole bit about the creed, but he kind of 
romanticizes the creed and i don't mean romanticism like idealizes it i mean he does what novala says he he makes it romantic he draws out what is romantic in it which is gorgeous but the thing is when, when he when he was asked if he were a christian Goethe said well i have a christianity for my own private use <laughs> <laughs> i totally get that um because when you think about it now you guys tell me what you think this is I, i've been thinking about this for the last few days in fact i did a yesterday i did a video on my channel about robert herrick the greatest poet who lived because he's the, well, the greatest christian pastor who ever lived because of Her in herrick's poetry he uh unlike um read george herbert and i love george herbert but read george herbert's poetry it's very doctrinaire anglican you know armenian um but herrick's not herrick is a he's he can't tell, is he christian is he a folk pagan? Is he a, you know, is he Christian pagan? Is he a Roman pagan? He writes, it's all mixed up. And I think what's, what happened, and that's romantic, but I think that the thing is, is, and we live in this age of, and we, and we see this, Mike and Lindsay, with the ortho bros and the traddies who are always ripping on, on us or me. And I was going to say, don't riff on me too much, but I'm not as, I'm not as. It's okay. <laughs> I'm sticking my neck out. Well, it's because because yeah. <laughs> I critique them. I got I got I, I got attacked this week. But the point I'm trying to make is, and I think this is true, is that I don't care how much you you say you follow this or that, you know, confession to the to the T. You don't. You don't, because it's it's not not even only not possible. It's it's inhuman. And there's and there's not room. It's there's no room for the numinous in that. That's just say more of, about that. that. So you're saying like that. Follow the confession, like that. That these people would claim that they're coloring within every line, but you're just saying they're not. No, but, but I think in their lives hypocrisy? they don't. Okay, right, right. I think and I think if you scratch people who say they do that, they actually you'll you'll go, wow, you don't you're not really consistent there, are you? <laughs> okay, gotcha. You know, and which is not I'm not, and I don't want to call people hypocrites. I'm not trying to call people hypocrites. Yes. I'm just saying it's not even a little. <laughs> no, all I'm saying is no, you don't do that. You know, we well, nobody does that. No, it's true. It's, it's true that I think that there's this, I mean, even in the gospels, it talks about Jesus talking about, you know, you're, you're, you're to a certain point, your prayer life is private. You go in your closet and you do it by yourself. There are, th there are rituals that bring community together. And then there's a very, very internal experience that is that mediation of, of, you know, of the Christic or, you know, the transcendent with yourself. Um, and no one can really borrow or peer into that. So there, I mean, yes, you can follow creeds, you can recite all these things, but how people actually interact with what the, what that meaning is for them is very individual. And so there's, there's like a, as much as we, we, you know, portray the, you know, lack of um, ecumenalism and the the fracturing, there is like, if, if we could see the, the, the spirit that actually binds everyone in the seeking of, we want to be completed. We want to feel whole. Like perfection isn't like arriving at the, the perfect way of, you know, following this item but finding wholeness being complete in our actual experience of god i think is you know the whole idea even of the fallen world is that when it reaches completion that's its perfection it's wholeness not like some idealized beyond you know human endeavor yes and that's what i learned Perfect. Yeah. robert herrick is that the messiness is part of the structure absolutely has to be has right? to be got to be so it's okay that, you know, and that's why I think people make themselves nuts. I seriously mean this by trying to be too doctrinaire or whatever they're trying. You know what I mean? They could they get too strict, too austere, and and that's what Berjayev calls false asceticism, right? Uh, and they become assholes because they just do, right? Because well, I, think, I think there's also like even in Goethe though that that in Faust there is that line where the angels say you know those who strive with all their might we're allowed to save I think there is this idea if you sh if you just do it hard enough like I believe hard enough it will be okay versus going to live openly versus closed right. it's such a, a lost thing that we we've we've become so closeted so I guess it's so strict so the walls are everywhere that only this way can Christ enter only this so way Lindsay, can when I they be 
when when they say that that stuff from Goethe, if they put that in the category, I always kind of reference it saying that, you know, Goethe put on the map the category of striving as like yes. in and of itself good. Yeah. But unpack that a little bit because you're saying, is it like the worst being the corrupts or the best that like the striving for this like ortho bro, like, dude, I fasted five days in a row versus oh. how do you care? <laughs> bam, 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 bam. Six here, bam. I, I, right. think what it, I think what striving has come to mean is effort versus authenticity. Okay. So you're good. So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Say more. Go. So, so I, I think that we are so, and, and maybe it is kind of the nature of all religions that eventually we get stuck in the letter always. We start performing things versus being things. And so when you, when you say I am a Christian versus, you know, like I, I do Christianity. I, I had, I had a rabbi teach me, um, you know, uh, Hebrew when I was in, in undergrad still. And he would discuss about, you know, do, how do you do, how do you do, do, how do you do these things? That's like, great. Right, that, that he said, anytime you, you enter a movement, you stop moving because it becomes this confined, crystallized state. How can you be in the, this sounds very, very woo woo, in the flow of it? But it's more just right. being receptive, right? It's not being a passive participant. All romanticism is about the participation of, you know, the human soul, human mind, human heart with both the transcendent and imminent at once. If you can't be in right. both places, you know, ultimately be receptive to both places, you're going to be tied or torn into, right? And we either somewhere else, very Gnostic, very removed from the body, or you're going to be so grounded that you get into, I mean, I love a lot of the pagan folks so if it's coming back into the, the myth themes and stuff that's discussion on the, you know, well, the Twitter stage at least, right? But also a lot of them I find are very materialistic. It's very much about genetics and genealogy and it loses, they have the stories, but there's no, there's no, it's, it's all about eternal return. So somebody Christian. reads like Norse myth and then they want to prove that they have Norse blood. Is that what you're saying with the genealogy? No, stuff? more like, so like more that the, uh, the idea of the gods are the, the first inheritance of that lineage of people. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so um, it's, it's, and it's not so much different than some of the, you know, I guess the very Orthodox, you know, Jews that consider themselves to be the incarnation of Yahweh in, to in Toto. Right. So mm -hmm. like as, as a people, so there seems to be, um, you know, the idea of the metaphysics of the, of the gods as being, you know, forces of intelligence, or, or even how Pseudonysus dis discusses this from, you know, moving from um, the angel or the gods into the angelo and the hierarchies kind of becomes, you know, lost as being, it's, oh, it can't be transcendent because all there really is is nature gods and the world here. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so I hope that makes sense. <laughs> it does. It does. Well, yeah. So, so one place, you know, you, and you were just touching on it there for a second, Lindsay. Is uh, and you've been doing you've been doing some great threads on this, and I think it's connected to this kind of Christian romanticism connected to romantic love. Yes. And, and this is uh, I wrote about this in I had long I think it's the longest chapter in the book in Sophia in Exile. I have a long chapter on marriage because I think so. I think gen Christianity in general has gotten it wrong from the beginning just about or at least not completely right from the beginning. And in in Catholic and Orthodox realms, this um, manifests in, you know, it's the, the unspoken rule that uh, the celibate state is above the married state, which is- Yeah. Flyer! No. Uh, well, no, well, it's just so interesting because if you actually look at like even the, the earliest- parts of Jesus's ministry when he when, for one he tries to escape the cities as fast as possible and the crowds as fast as possible where does he go he goes into the houses and courtyards that are ruled by the feminine world the hearth the home the family the early Christianity could not have existed if it wasn't for the feminine underground so to speak right, right? Well, and that's well, the yeah. where the whole idea of the Magdala comes and Magdalene is that the tour the tower the patroness of Basically, you know, it, it's not any different than Beatrice leading, you know, Dante up through, up through, you know, to Elysium is that there's this guardianship of the feminine of the soul in humans, in man, in culture that kind of has been lost, you know, through feminism, all kinds of other different, you know, variants. But the original, you know, home of Christianity was these, the private spaces of the world. It wasn't a public, you know, thing until it became, you know, Roman Catholicism and, you know, and Constantine. But the earliest ministry parts were in that very, very small cloister of privacy and, and intimacy that was the feminine realm. Where have so. you been hiding Lindsay Rose, Michael Martin? It's pretty They're wild stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're staying anonymous but, on Twitter as much as possible? <laughs> well, all I know is there's a bunch of I don't of guys tweet. I'm just on Twitter. I follow you. 
There's a bunch of guys right now calling their spiritual fathers. You never told us about this stuff. I think think she's lying, right? Well, one thing I heard, you know, working at the monastery, and I'm hearing, I I hope it's a sign of the times, but, um, or maybe I could put it this way. It seems to me that the best priests and the best monks, and and even I've got a dear friend who uh, just, he and his wife weren't able to be blessed with children, but he'll say there's a part of him, and I, gosh, he seems more mature than me, but he'll say there's a part of him that couldn't grow up right without fatherhood or marriage and some of these things you know another distinction i think it is and the other one would be for christian marriage Um, i got this from ivan illich you know instead of and i think my wife and i both embodied it um, when we got married it it wasn't this kind of new way of like me looking at somebody and saying like we will stay together forever we (laughs) no it's this kind of muscle thing right just another version illich kind of gave me the phrase that like when you get married it's kind of just like it's the poetic of the road not taken Um, I renounce the freedom of divorce. Boom. So that decision is behind me, who I'm married to. And then you get this whole notion, which is equal to maturity, of this notion of moving through life. You know, I'm not far from the home of Christopher Lash, the great social critic, who said, you know, when you reduce choice to the choice between Coke and Pepsi, Coke today, Pepsi tomorrow, you never, you've reduced, you've robbed choice of its meaning. Meaning, in another sense, you just never developed the idea of choice that you're moving on from something and you're putting something behind you right. which is a very mature way of looking at it this notion kind of coming from not from theology of the body itself but from some of that rebirth that people talk about the body and courtship and all that stuff it's well, yeah. just this notion that we're we got more strength to do this thing just by look looking at you and saying we will never ever 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 break up you and, know? The, and that was interesting <laughs> so when it, was- it always cracks me up when I was preparing this, uh, strong arm marriage doesn't quite yeah. sound like the idea of us appealing <laughs> things, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're Catholic, so it'll never, you're never, happen. you're never leaving. And that was actually one of the things that you know, um, working with women in college and stuff who had been abused and things like that was, was it was really hard to come into the more trad t- communities, which I was very kind of. I love the the artistry. I love sitting in you know candlelight mass. I love the, those experiences, but to come into the nitty gritty of what it meant to be. Oh, well, unless, you know, unless there's adultery, you can't leave a marriage ago. Well, what if he's like hurting her? They will, and I literally have heard Trav Burrows on Twitter go, well, he, she should have known that she's a better guy. I'm like, well, okay, then, then you then all the men and all the fathers need to step back into the courtship world and guide their daughters into, you know, knowing how to choose the good, the good you know, the good godly men. So that has well, always yeah, been I mean, one. Yeah. And that's, that's absurd, right? It's, it's, it's not how things really work. No, and the war of the sexes has been crazy. So, yeah, yeah very messy. Than that. Yeah, and, and I, but I think you point. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna say, um, when I was prepping that talk on Robert Herrick, one of the things that really jumped me out at me at this time when I was looking through his poetry, it well, it's how often he celebrates courtship and you know boys getting with girls and and he's got these long epithalamiums that he writes you know to his friends when they're married and you know it, because that's that's those are things we're supposed to celebrate right yes, because that's, of course they're all the things not because those are that's literally pro-life absolutely pro-life. I, the, the, the dating the dating world and you know the all the as you guys have both know with the, with the college generations now and how they experience you know intimacy in the dating world is I am so glad I didn't grow up now, um, so difficult, be, yeah. you know, but, but still the idea of like a courtship was you meet somebody you really like, and you get to understand what they are on the interior, because for generations, the idea of physical intimacy was a bonding mechanism. It wasn't brought forward until the intimacy of persons was established. And so it was a way to cement something, not to, you, you can, you know, cement yourself with someone who's very, very, very dangerous to you if yeah. you're not careful. But yeah. the idea of courtship was this beautiful, I think like, very high you know it's high school crush kind of like intimacy of who are you as a person do you have the yeah. same books you have the same ideas can we talk forever if we become you know what will our life build from besides just you know the physical and we've come so become so physical that the idea of romantic love which is transcendent and intimate seems an impossibility it is and that says great mm-hmm. things for our idea of god as well if god can't be intimate with us i mean this is this is what jesus talks about and when he refers to you know the idea of of Adam and Eve and the idea of one flesh, the idea of the church coming back into, into embodiment is a marriage. So it's, it's, it's not, you know, if you want to go into, you know, the Gnosticism, the idea of plerma and fullness, the idea of completion is part of that language. Mm-hmm. So marriage is a great, 
a great and, and romantic love that that unfolding of personhood in collaboration is one of the most beautiful ways to I think reflect that I, I don't have any problem with with monkhood or cloister I think that the power of the divine in visitation is very very overwhelming sometimes and people sometimes need to not be in the outer world to be able to totally. you know experience that and it has its place and I wish that more people understood that that was a route they could take they don't have to you know we have such a limited idea of what it means to be human or uh, have an, a vocation in this world. And that's a vocation that still needs to be, you know, enjoyed by those who are called to it and not feel that they're weirdly called to it either. But this lack of seeing how the bond of bodies and souls in confluence is somehow a religious or not, or too sexual or too sensual or too body, mm. I think misses the whole point of the incarnation. Well, yeah. In fact, uh, I'm glad you mentioned it because this week just celebrated uh the birthday of my wife but we also celebrated the day before that the feast of the, of the assumption yes. and there was a, it was going on the x you ever hear that song by his <laughs> top i heard it i heard it i heard it on the x and i haven't heard that it's a good one <laughs> uh, how, how does that tie into assumption i'm missing something okay no but on the x okay somebody shared something this Oh, Somebody. Twitter, Twitter, gotcha. I, I, I call it Twix now. That's what I, oh, that's how I, okay, that's <laughs> that's I refer yeah. to. It. I like that. I'm going to call it Twix. Now. But there is this image of the Virgin. Modern looking, I, icon like, but not really an icon. Not a, Certainly not a traditional icon. Oh, I saw Her this, hair is yes. a little, you know, disheveled. And she's holding the baby. And it's a beautiful image. And on her, her mantle, there's a is a Celtic dragon. It's actually from Book of Kells. Yeah. Right. And it's gorgeous. It's got the four evangelists behind her. It's just a beautiful piece of work. I, mean, I think uh, I don't know if it's digital digitally done or it looks like a deviant art. It probably is hand drawn. It was a deviant AI, art but yeah. yeah, it's probably but it was not AI, but it probably was but done by a person kinda, using illustration. It. Yeah. But it's it's gorgeous. But it is gorgeous. But the That's thing awesome. is the ortho bro bros lost their shit about it because her they, hair is too they, sensual they must what have been having thought. yeah there's a, there's a book out about an image of our lady of guadalupe our friend uh, stephen clark has written on this michael uh there's a, a an image of somebody drew an image of our lady of guadalupe a little more real a little more sensual and so forth and then there was a book written about the whole reception of that and i forget but it's uh it's it's probably googleable with just those ideas but the same type of thing um and, and that's to me it's 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 you know because I, I didn't find that to be um, a sexualized picture at all. No, it's a real danger zone because it's it's we have to move in that direction, but people could do it gratuitously and cheaply, I suppose. But I, I found but, this one tasteful. Yeah, but it, it was tasteful. <laughs> I wondered if I found it tasteful or sensual, though, right? So, well, and again, we're I think in our time we're supposed to try and work on that stuff. And but the, the sensuality, we're not opposed, we, so not opposed, we right. appeal to the senses, right? Which uh -huh. is he was just talking about. I mean, I think we all, and this is uh, the Romantics had this. I mean, the German and English Romantics had this, where you know, part of what I think people who are attracted to orthodoxy or Latin right Catholicism, they love the sensuality of the liturgy, the smells and the bells, right? And the chants and the, the aesthetic experience of it, right? Because it, it's, an, it's an experience of beauty. I think that's what that, 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 that experience now, of beauty fine. can yeah. translate. Uh, um, a, and just like, as Lindsay said, just the spaces. Bonnie and I, when we first got married, we used to go, there's a place in the Detroit area called Cranbrook which is uh, very much, uh, the, who, I can't remember the name of the guy who started it, but who was really inspired by William Morris. And he, in fact, they have a little museum there and it's got a lot of William Morris stuff in it, which you'd, you'd not think about that in Detroit, but it's there. But they have a church there too, Christ Church Cranbrook, which is a Episcopalian church, but it's it's really Gothic revival. It is beautiful, this building. And we would just go and sit there, like we even when the my our older kids were little, we would take them for walks because there's a nice wooded area around there and parks, and we then we'd go, we'd go into the church just just to sit and and soak in the vibes, right? And and once in a while, the organist would come in and start practicing for Sunday mass, and we would just like this <laughs> is an experience, right? Well, we because we love those spaces and we love the, these this idea of a sacred space. And you see this also in, and I wrote about it in the um, 
Christian Romanticism piece uh, in Novalis in his booklet or pamphlet, um, uh, Christendom yeah, or Europe, know. Christendom or Europe, where it you could read it as nostalgia for the Middle Ages, for medieval Christianity, right? Um, but 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 the same thing you could see that the same thing with distributism, which is a kind of hankering for for small is beautiful, right? Because we want to have meaningful experiences in those even our economic exchanges, which we don't have, you know. <laughs> go to your shopping cart on Amazon or whatever, right? Not the same <laughs> thing. Um, as is as going into a used bookstore and and even enjoying that. Don't you love the used bookstore smell? Oh, that old glue, goodness, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that that's the bomb. Right I have there. lost many about. I have lost many hours of my life in bookshops. That's yes. for sure. Yeah. But no, what you're saying about essential, I think, is so important. And like, you know, even the idea and the Gothic, especially, you know, and Abbot CJ, who kind of created that that architectural style to to actually welcome in God as light that permeates the physical realm through this like this this filtering and this this beauty is so wonderful. And you know, I mean, gosh, even you know, even listen to you talk, I think about you know Blake and I William Blake, and I think about how um, I actually had a really good professor friend of mine really dive in with me at one point. Um, how Blake talks so much about how it's the body that Christ is healing, sight, vision, ambulatory movement, things that are extraordinarily body, you know, he is healing these things so that the body can be complete so that it perceives correctly. I mean, it's just, right. I think it's just a, you know, this idea of, of um, as I write in, in the essay for Jesus of the Imagination, you know, it's, it's this idea of, um, of choosing the, the resplendent and the beauty and the splendid and, and the spectacle in a divine way versus like the guinea sun. So. Mm -hmm. and right the guinea sun and that and that so the interesting thing is i want you want, want you to think about this is so there there seems to me in this room this romantic and christian christian romantic intuition we can call it yeah there's something that you want to hold on to something special from the past and you know you don't want to throw it away yeah but you don't want to chain to it either right and and it's really if you think about it it's kind of uh so so we have the past and we revere the past but we're not slaves to it hopefully not well hopefully not right because the, i think when we become slaves to it then then it's like those guys who freaked out about that picture of the virgin mary right so like, i just this i'm talking to my spiritual father about this right <laughs> <laughs> i'm talking you know, to my spiritual father just yeah. tone it down it's but, true <laughs> They were how do I deal with this? Like, you know, how do I deal with like go home and love your wife? It'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm having impure thoughts. Uh but but the other thing is 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 there's also something coming from the future. So if remembering if, the future, I love this concept. Right. That's yeah. the Zulus and so forth. But so we could make a distinction here if the title's kind of Christian romanticism. You know, we can bring in Jung to a certain extent, Lindsay. This might be where Kingsley has a hang up, but I don't think so the way he talks. But um, so if we just use Barfield and say, you know, original participation, alienation, final participation, what the Steinerian and the romantic worldview, I think, gives us is that, um, and I don't even think we need to bring in reincarnation, for example, we could, yeah. but it would be, um, you know, that their spirit congeals into matter, you know, then through an individuation, you know, yes. that uh, at the incarnation, that it goes back into spirit. Young, you know, and Tayar falls to this, you know, that, um, Young and Teilhard both kind of bought this idea that matter, you know, kind of just turns into spirit. And I think to be truly Christian romantic, and the only way you can let go of that obsession or that not obsession, that love of the past, is when you know that that, that past, that spirit is recapitulated at a higher level. It's like yes. moving from the first movement of a symphony. Why would you ever let that go? It's so harmonious. But we all know that when they introduce that discord, it's going to be woven into the higher harmony. Right. But, but yeah, like, but that Young is going to fall through. short. Teilhard is going to fall short. Yeah. And these are important distinctions, you know. And they probably do bring up the issue of reincarnation, you know. Yeah, I mean, and as actually uh, um, a podcast you guys did a few weeks ago with Stephen Clark that also got me really um, him talking that guy's about wild. Steiner. Oh yeah. my gosh, I, I went looking through all of his stuff, you know, just because I was really, really curious and really, I had never heard this part of Steiner's work before ever. And so I went just to go hunt, you know, I'm a little yeah. research fiend. So I went and hunted those down and found RJ Stewart's work and stuff. And this idea yeah. of like the underground and, and the, the, you know, 
this is also, I think, where Kingsley is interested in the idea of Parmenides and Persephone, this idea of the, the sure. falling and rising goddess, right? This idea of like, that used to be what kind of was, she was the one that kind of walked you through these worlds. That was, this was her realm, but she also knew how to get out of it come springtime. Yeah, and I yeah. feel like a lot of our tradition, I think the idea of bringing back into Christianity's idea of like the harrowing of hell is a huge thing and no one really talks about it. They right. go, oh, he did that on the day that he was, you know, not here and everyone was born. They go, right. but what, but what actually happened, what happened in the underworld? And the whole idea of, this is actually, the, the Orthodox iconography is great because you have the best of Capaises of him leaving hell. This is a very womb-like symbol. The idea of the earth giving back spirit as a transcendent, transfigured self, you know, in a resurrected body. This is a huge, huge, like, I don't know, it, 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 sparks all You're of right my creativity kingsley, kingsley is super important on that because again right. like these guys they they went into their iatromantic states buried in mud or whatever and again right. they met the divine feminine who spoke to them in poetry and again we have to see logic as coming from poetry poetry is original participation you know absolutely um in, in you know any student who's had me just and even my own children, the shorthand is just circle, line, circle, right? You know, the original circle to the line, then the circle and the line interwoven. That's the basic symbol. And right. that's probably the herald under which Christian romanticism can move forward. Original participation, alienation, final participation. Right. You know, it's East, West, and then East, West combined, which my hero, John Kaprapawis, would say, the combination of East and West is in in a... In Welsh mythology, the African secret, the African secret. I kind of like that right. image too. Yeah. That the 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 male and the female combined isn't, you know, we still got to figure out, is it androgyny? All these Russians were debating that. Berjayev, oh. those are the great battles of our right. times. What so, exactly is that mystery? You know? Well, so well, for, it, from I'll pull from my from my like my eastern side just to discuss yeah, no. this briefly. Yeah. When you get into the idea of like Shiva Shakti, which is the ultimate idea of the, you know, combined, um, people get very involved with this. It's an androgynous thing. It's like, no, it's it's discussing the fact that the divine and the phenomenal are always intertwined. They're never actually truly separate. But the idea that we think they are, that's the problem. So the idea of Shiva actually means no thingness. It is not, it is unmanifest potential. It is the foundation of existence, of beingness itself, fullness itself, right? And you, you have this idea of, of, that's that is transcendence entirely and that's the masculine realm it is the seeding property of mm -hmm. divine cosmos right, right. Mm -hmm. the idea of shakti is manifest phenomena it is this, the entire physical cosmos that you can interact with your senses that and there the idea of like shaivism or tantra is like and i'm not talking sexually but like the idea is that at every moment the in-breath out-breath is linked alpha and omega death and birth every single moment and that is the feminine and the masculine combined right. always so it's not about being an androgyn where we're actually literally half and half it's this idea that the the set the uh sensual love is the power and source of the universe mm -hmm. so it's you know it, and not in a dirty way but in like in a a beautiful way yes yeah, yeah. precisely and i and now we you see that in Sufi poetry, you see yes. it. You see it in the troubadours who were inspired by Sufi poetry, and you also see it in Michelangelo, right? Yes. So you, if you go, I mean, you look at his 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 Madonnas, you know, the Madonna and Child, but then the Pieta. And yes, then, absolutely. And the last and, judgment. The, Piet the Pieta Mary is ginormously huge. She's not yeah. a human Mary there at all. That is divine feminine holding the Absolutely. cradling the death of god it's a yeah. it's beautiful and the idea of mary so in sophiology is being either a marian tradition or more of a persephone tradition obviously depends on where you're pulling from i do like also what my daughter was saying you know that peter kingsley discusses a lot in catafalque that you know and you, all the union stuff is that the age for the search of the grail kind of has come to and we have to become the grail now we have to become that vessel we can't go looking externally for it we have to be it Yes. Think, and, I, and I don't I, want to break. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, that's the well, so one of the I mean one of the tragedies of our own cultural moment, right? With so many young people confused about what their even their gender is, right? Is they're they're unable to access the, the exactly they're to see in themselves exactly what we're talking about, and they think surgery is going to help, or you know, some kind of drastic measure will help cure some external thing will, will will cure an inner dysfunction right they've lost the idea of personhood they're they're completely exchanging in my opinion they're mistaking the what for who 
That's Gnosticism, mm -hmm. right? That's the, that's, that's the dirty Gnosticism. I think, there, I think there's some good points in Gnosticism. I, I there tend is. to there too. But, that's, but, the, but that's there the is. But yes, that's the, that's the bad Gnosticism. I don't think the that's, point is to like avoid Gnosticism and Pelagianism, which is what Pope Francis is thing in. It's right. to be a Pelagian and a Gnostic at the same time. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's going to be my contribution to theology. Like there, everybody's there, trying to like skirt both of them, embrace them both, have knowledge. And, is, and yeah, and, this and is one of the things I've been talking about anyway with on Twitter is that this idea that we think we the Christian versus Gnostic schism, you know, even though they kind of are founded out of the same, you know, hopes, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that in, in both ways, they both deny the body in separate ways and both are also still seeking that absolute internal right. divine revelation of intuitive knowing that is that the noetic part they're both actually yeah. you know for the most part gnosis becomes like mind it becomes oh i know all these things and therefore i'm saved by all these secret things and words i know okay. you know and but that's not what it is gnosis in terms of not wisdom sophia that is internal knowing that that is the moment where peter is to ask me so who do you think i am he says you are the son of the living god that's gnosis that is divine yeah. instant revelation yeah, and uh, I'm just gonna drop a little, drop some heresy for y'all right here. Drop some heresy, so yo, yo, yo. We got a, we got our own cool also, bro. We got some old school drops. heresy going on. Well, I oh, do. Boy. Now this is at my master's program at a Jesuit university, and one of my Jesuit professors, theologian, really brilliant man, um, Father Justin Kelly. Uh, we're oh, we're talking about the Gospel of Saint John. He goes, Michael. That's the most Gnostic text you're gonna find. Right, right, right. It is. It I know, is. in a good way. Well, so I'm saying, way. you know, don't don't you think it's analogous what I said about we have to become both? It's somewhat analogous to the Western Church's hang up on good and evil, where the Steiner, you know, worldview places, you know, you have Aramonic and you have Luciferic, right? Mm -hmm. And um, that's the thing, you know, we're we're so worrying about, you know, in one generation we're avoiding Gnosticism. I get it, and in a sense. The, the church is trying to navigate that, but embrace them both. And it's another piece to this final participation thing I think we're talking about. And there's a seminal moment. Remember about eight weeks ago, Michael, I couldn't shut up about this guy, Gerald Hurd, you know, but he's in his book, The Human Venture. He takes where right before, right after the Islamic invasion of India, there was movements and you would probably know more about this, Lindsay. There was movements in, um, oh, what do they call it? What's the, what's the buzzword for sexual yoga? You know, like Tantra. Um, tantra. tantra, right. There's movements what? in Tantra what that were moving towards. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's move. There were movements in Tantra. Then the Islamic invasion came down that were moving towards a higher form other than tragedy, humor, like a spiritual yes. humor. And I yeah. think of, you know, man is the man who laughs. Or when we talk about early on, this came up for Blake. We have people who, you know, they don't want to give up something. They just can't give up the singularity of this thing called Christianity and Christ. But for Blake, of course, the one thing that you find in Christianity that you just can't find in others is this um, forgiving others. You know, that was the liturgy yes. for him. This is the bread, this is the wine. I forgive you, you forgive me. But some of these themes of a higher comedy too, and I've only seen it in Gerald Hurd's book, but I, I think the West is looking for it. And I think when we bring in the feminine, we bring in the body and so forth, there has to be this huge kind of, belly laugh that i usually associate with the old show the a-team when yeah. when somebody might say or how about when they say okay, God only laughs like and, yeah. Yeah. or the idea of like i love it when a plan comes together i remember being in a theology class when uh abraham gives birth to isaac because i think laughter is oh. only used three or four times in the bible one song yeah. in the yeah. abraham and isaac story and isaac of course means he laughs but what is that feeling when he names no, sarah laughs. isaac it's yeah, joy sarah laughs. Yeah. It's, it's joy. Joy, joy and has also, humor I love it when in it. Plan it comes light. together. Yeah, yes. right, right. It's, yeah. it's 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 my it's what my daughter would call it's so satisfying. So satisfying. <laughs> night, it's so satisfying. It's joyful. There's yeah. lightness in it. It is it, it has its completion, but yeah, you laugh in joy. It's not like yeah. it's not it's it's a very um effervescent experience, right? Yeah, and that's why so. you're right, Michael. It's important that it was Sarah who laughed, you know. And yeah. yeah. But um well, yeah, we need yeah. I, the humor piece, I just think is not there. That's when we were into the uh, Reno Laurie, who is just so brilliant that, you know, I still can't say it enough that like um, A Hidden Life with Terrence Malik versus Charlie Chaplin, there's something about this technocratic age that we're all fighting. We're all fighting. I think we're fighting it by bringing Gnosticism and Pelagianism together. But this humor, this bubbling up humor, which is very feminine, is going to have to be yeah. part of it or we're done, you know. Absolutely. And even you discussing Lucifer and Armin, Lucifer, you know, Senator will say Lucifer very much loves the good old days. 
Mm-hmm. He loves to think about all all the things that were so golden and ornate that was the past that can no longer be touched. It's 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 nostalgia. It's that pain of something that you no longer can have. Mm-hmm. And Armin kind of is or in a satanic in general tends to push you into the future too fast. It it right. it it, out, it outsteps you. And the technocracy definitely is an outstep, right? So yeah. yes. like this idea of Steiner talking about the the Christ impulse as being the balance point, that's where growth is. And that is precisely where Christian romanticism becomes a, a vital yeah. thing again, because if we go back to the original romantics in the 18th century, 19th century, they were they were responding to the Enlightenment and the and the scientific revolution, right? Yes, and they and they kind of to this the, when you watch even the, the whole movement of of the romantics and how when that failed you kind of come into this idea of psychology and you get into Jung and Freud and all other you know possible mess that that has led to because basically it's like, it's like taking all the gods and stuffing them inside your psyche and there's no there, there, there's no longer a way to you know what's so funny about Jung and discussing the idea of the collective unconscious is that's basically the soup of the physical world where everyone's projections get you know dealt with unconsciously because we've kind of internalized all these gods, we've removed the enchantment from the world. We we now are struggling with it inside ourselves because we're actually too small to carry it all. We're supposed mm-hmm. to share it with each other, and that that's been, been lost, I think, in a lot of the great greater rituals. And I think it's also part of like why you know the best parts of church are say the liturgy, those most transcendent, where we're in collaboration with the divine in presence together. But it's also something that, that joyful bit might be missing. Well. And and that's I mean you know unfortunately uh, even in the the Anglican uh, cycle of of scripture it and this is what you don't see in Thomas Traherne is this you know as Monty Python makes fun of it in the, in the <laughs> ground, right when the when God appears to the to the knights and they all oh forgive us we are so bad he goes oh stop <laughs> groveling I'm so <laughs> tired <laughs> right I love it. every yeah. every time I appear it's forgive me for this I'm sorry for that I'm stopping um so it can be a drag right and and this is what I, I think kind of going forward and this is uh, and you see this you know in who kind of the weirdest places two places to see it dh lawrence mm. and kenneth rexroth who so both much. wanted to redeem sexual relationship and and they wanted to make it sacred again a sacrament right? it's, as it should be and they, that's what they wanted to and and but they were both they both in fact kenneth, kenneth rexroth was a uh, practicing catholic to the day he died <laughs> you know he would but he's a pretty radical thinker Nevertheless, and D. H. Lawrence had this—you uh, would, I would call it pretty profound attraction for Christianity, though he rejected the uh, institutional norms. Okay. But they knew that they—they they knew that this was the centerpiece. And we we talked about Jung earlier, right? And Jung also, his intuition was right on the money with the idea of the animus and the anima, right? Yeah that this integrate this is what's missing and this is why Jung got so excited in the 1950s when the uh, the catholic church uh proclaimed the doc, doc dogma of the immaculate conception right is that all right now, now we're, we're, we're moving toward integration this is a good thing it's a good move <laughs> and then they backed up. and then they backed up just to make friends good with play. the Protestants after the vatican ii but uh but you have, you have a lot not, of people that, listening, not... Michael, who would say that we have integrated the uh, this the sensual now through the theology of the body. But my main contention with that, too, and in favor of what you're saying, D.H. Lawrence and Rex Roth and others, and it's not one aspect of it is the humor piece again, right? I've mentioned my my love for this guy, Stephen Visenshi, who died a couple of years ago, a great novelist. Um, and he, uh, he wrote this Penguin Modern classic in praise of older women. <laughs> and uh, it was about the life of a philanderer. And um, it was just brilliant, totally brilliant. A work of genius. It's been translated into like 23 languages. But he caught the humor in the whole thing, right? Um, and uh, Theology of the Body d- doesn't quite often bring that part in. But I was just bringing that up to say that a lot of people have said the Catholic Church or whatever, we're right there on all this stuff, Mike. Well, we caught up with you with Theology of the Body. Well, it's because it's difficult to be lectured about sexuality from from lifelong celibates right i, mean, <laughs> I always but, wondered about that, that. Theory, i go to a spiritual father and say i'm hiring possible my marriage and they've never experienced it themselves i know which <laughs> is heretical to say it's by definition ideology at that point it's ideology yeah 
it's theory versus practice, right? Yeah, ideology. You know? Which is academia in a nutshell. Oh it is. Prioritizing the theoretical over the practical. The person yeah. who, uh, that's why he's in the art of motorcycle maintenance is good, right? It begins <laughs> with <laughs> fixing a motorcycle. It doesn't begin with ideas about fixing a motorcycle. Yeah, yeah. I have a theory for fixing motorcycles. Yeah. <laughs> Actually try to fix it. I have an idea. Let's see how it goes. Um, I mean... I mean, so this is this is all. I mean, there's. So let's go back. We 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 got sidetracked. Yeah. So you, you have on the one side the tradition, right? Which the romantics, you know, present and past have. An, there's a there's a pull for this kind of aesthetic tradition, or or and liturgical tradition, as well as. Um, and I think you see it in. Even though it becomes so intellectualized, and the attraction that a lot of educational, um, in educational quarters for uh, like a classical education, for instance, right? That's a kind of romanticism, right? There, it, there's a hankering for something we have lost, right? Yeah, there, there's a there, but but it still isn't it. But it's not. It is, it's not making it right. It doesn't go far enough because I feel like. And this is something that Steiner was really aware of. Is like, and I love the classical schools for a lot of reasons, but they don't really include the art piece much or the poetry piece much in terms of the students themselves. Yeah, they might learn how to write a sonnet because they're learning iambic pentameter, but the idea of being in communion with the muse or with the or with Sophia or with you know heaven right. forbid God itself, God himself, you know, this is this is not something that is the idea of like transmission when it comes to christian romanticism is like you have to take that that living thread and that's what you're passing forward but it has to be in a place where it can grow if tradition becomes stagnant it's not really helping you much and this is not me saying like oh we need to completely you know speak to the times and be no i'm not saying yeah. that at all i'm talking about the living thread that is you know even what um evelyn underhill of christian is going to survive it has to find its mystic heart it has to be able to grow still and i feel that if we in this age of, of technocracy, if we can't find our spirit in our bodies anymore, we're going to be in trouble. We are in trouble. We're going to be in trouble. Understatement no, of the day. And, and we're so know. in trouble. We're so in trouble already. It's we're crazy. so in trouble. Yeah. And people don't even recognize, recognize you, you yeah. don't recognize this loss of like, it, as much as we discuss the idea of, oh, the Gnostics deny the body, there's also the idea of death to the world and transcend the world and ha well, we'll get our reward in heaven. It's like, if I read the Bible correctly, heaven comes down here. Yeah, right. We're supposed to bring it here, which is the, the whole idea of the incarnation is that anchoring of that that wondrous divinity in the here and now. Yeah. That's the new world. That's, 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 that's where the, the whole, that's that's William Blake is the strongest. The exactly. Strongest. And, but we and don't give an about inch. that. He doesn't even have any nostalgia for the other. Thank you for He's saying always, that. always on point on that one. Right. So the so idea that this abnegation of duty that we kind of are stuck with, well, well it'll be good to better in heaven. God will fix it. It's like God put us here to fix it. You know, that we hear about, you know, that the, why does God, and this is even speaking to myself and my issues with loss and stuff in my own life is like, well, why does God allow these things? Well, God goes, well, why do you allow these things? You're there. Why don't you fix it? Get, get together, yeah. Stop, you know, stand up. Let's do something about it. Uh -huh. Where and, we can have compassion for people on this one is like, again, with the notion of the evolution of consciousness. Yes. You know, I, sometimes I blame people. And it's not like, well, I'm not saying the three of us have evolved consciousness far from no, it. No, no, no. But it is new. It is new. If you read Catholic history books, we got to say there's things that are changing. Right yeah. now, uh, students have come up to me and said, Sauter, like you're always using this phrase like 2,000 years after the incarnation, like there's some change. I'm like, I swear to God, there's got to be a change or I'm out of this game. <laughs> but but it's, it's um, you know, we it's like preaching that puts that into place. That was, you know, the, again, the evolution, not the change. Um, but the evolution of consciousness is that there are human obligations now that we have the power to do. Jesus said, you'll be able to move mountains and so forth. Yeah. And, right. and, and this is a, actually, you know, it kind of happened much faster than I anticipated. But when I wrote Transfiguration and the last chapter is, is Sophia in Armin, right? I still think it's a very important chapter that should be kind of published standalone. Well, and that was well, the, just the thing. I, yeah. you know, I knew, I saw what the problem was going to be. I just didn't realize it was going to happen in two years. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just in your face, you right got there a little quicker. Yeah. You but were I prophetic, Michael. That's all. Yeah. Well, well, I think what um, 
And this, and this is like Lindsay was saying, well, what are you going to do, right? So, well, you know, like, the, ever see that movie, what's it called? The Untouchables? Right. Oh, when, uh, Sean Connery's character gets shot and he's dying. He says, what are you prepared to do? <laughs> yes. to do right? And, and that's, and I think that's the terrifying thing for a lot of people right now. Yes. Because we want to let the spiritual father tell us what to do, or we want to, or the Pope or the patriarch or, you know, some authority to tell us what to do. I would draw Venn diagrams and say, like, right now for myself, you know, we had that father at Dillon on um, about monasticism. He's a great church historian and he and I talk a lot, but he likes the fact that it's not exactly a Venn diagram, but if we're, you, if we're in one of like Chesterton's five deaths of the faith, you know, six or seven, that is is the next thing being born is it going to be born recognizably within the confines of what we kind of know as the church now is it going to be in a hinterland a liminal space or is it going to be outside i'm what i do is i'm just kind of looking for seeds and all those because i don't see um i don't see a pure lesson from history that we know definitively but right now i've got a i've got a foot in all camps but not (laughs) out of fear not out of fear it's just history has kept me with a foot in all camps you know, good. And then it's a good place to be. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why I, your last well, article, your 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 camping out here, the well, catacombs, right? Yeah, the catacombs, but also the Celtic Church is kind yes. of a model for me because they're outside. Yeah, but still connected. But how about this model? Like when we say like the Catholic Church baptized old pagan shrines, you know, we went there and we baptized them. Quite often we filled up the springs, right? But that was, you know, you were reading R.J. Stewart, Lindsay, and this whole yes. underworld thing. Yes. So the point is like we could talk about metaphors of lateralism. Is it going to be here, here, or here? Right. But we baptized. Now we got to unclog the springs and all those things. That's the repaganization right. that Chesterton's talking about. That's an emphasis on yeah. the divine feminine. And that's um, bottom up. You know, people maybe within, I don't know, though, you know, within a within an institutional church could be Methodism, but, you know, from the bottom up, just being done with one element. So there's a vertical thing and kind of the horizontal one. And yes. I've got a I've got a I've got a camp in all those places, too. <laughs> I've got fires everywhere. Yeah, yeah. But no, it's true. It's because the, the idea of, of that, that penetration of, you know, of the, the vertical arm of the cross, right? It, it has to penetrate into into the depths of, you know, the deep that we don't really want to see the, un, the underground of everything or the, yeah. the underworlds, right? And it's also this idea, I mean, this is something that Michael and I have talked about a lot as well is this idea of like, you know, the idea of the Fisher King, the idea yeah. of, you know, asking the right questions. What does it mean to asking ask the right, the right questions right now? Yeah. What does it mean to be a gardener of the, the of the, of paradise again? What is it, you know, Ma- Mary Magdalene mistakes Jesus for a gardener. We have all these right. parables of sowing seeds in the right kinds of soil. And, you know, sometimes the seed falls between the cracks, you know, into the interstitial realms, into the gaps, but that's the one that breaks through the concrete. It mm-hmm. just depends on, you know, where's the good soil right now right well that's you know speaking of the fisher king one of my favorite stories me too um i can't remember if this is something i came up with a long time ago or somebody somebody else came up with it let's say you came up but with that, that, that so the you king, take credit Michael. doesn't matter <laughs> but that the fisher king is actually in this original context is a metaphor for the church yeah right that's what's sick mm-hmm it's 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 really it's, well this, 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 no this but, but it has lost its way right and that, yeah. that needs to be the well yeah. maidens have all been raped and and discarded right and and this idea of the land has been lost because a lar- there's been a larger erasure of the feminine the feminine largely has been considered you know we're the sensual ones we're right. the left-hand path we're the ones that you know can't we're chaos and and, and we and we and we and we are but that's the whole point why you have apollo wrestling with python it's the idea of you know the 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 brain to bear or not not to tame to lose wildness but to cultivate it's a completely different thing and right now we have this idea we have to destroy one or the other to arrive at some kind of new adventure and that's not really what will work i don't think but look so. look in the grail stories who takes care of the grail but the women right the women yeah the women. and and it's the it's the men who are um maimed Michael, we, we and, and usually have, yeah. usually in intimate places, right? This idea right. of fecundity and fertility, also, yeah. But also, the father principle: you cannot be a father if you do not have children. If you have no fertility, how do you have progeny? Imagine, right. imagine, you know, as the imagination works as well. If you have nothing seeding in, whether it's by the muse or the inner, all this language we have, even with Boethius and philosophy, we have this idea of this interaction always with something that is feminine, something that is a matter that brings forth life. 
it's, it's, the, it's the kind of sacred little, you know, secret haha of the physical trinity that it's man, woman, child. Life comes from the combination of two. If you excise one, you, what do you have? Right. Didn't, didn't then you Stephen have, Clark yeah, point then out you the have, fact that we don't have any, uh, you know, the whole history of the Western Catholic Church is just like, you know, the seeds thrown, boom. You know, but like the forces that bring it to fructify, you know, fructification, so forth. We don't even have language for those mysteries. Well, you know? to answer Lindsay's question, what do you have? I mean, and this is coming down the pipe, right? The artificial womb, right? Oh, yes. We've we've denatured sex. We're, we're at least it's the artificial. It's the artificial Mary. It's the artificial virgin. It's That's really right. kind of scary. Yeah. And that blow up to all tre- It's tre- it's treacherous. Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah. And and I think and I think. You know, so that is, I mean, you even see with that image of the, the grail, which is so attractive to the pre-Raphaelites as well, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Who are, were late blooming romantics, right? Absolutely. Which leads to Yeats, who is also <laughs> blooming romantic, yes. right? And these are the things that, that the great poets, great artists are trying, are trying to re, not, uh, recapture is really the wrong word, but try, they're trying to like again, I'm going to say it again. You know this this connection to both the past and the future, yeah. right? And and how do we do that? And I think that's that's the and like you know I think was it who was it that said it? Hans Kung was like he the one that said the the Christian of the future will be mystical or won't exist at all. No, that's Carl Reiner. Carl Reiner. Yeah. And but uh. But that's true. But and I, that's absolutely true. But and, but the, the the as you know the history of the church, the who is in contention all the time are the mystics, and the theologians. And but what and Barfield wants to contribute to that kind of the church will be mystical or it'll be nothing. You know, in again in this book, Romantic Christianity. You know, you have, uh, you know, you got Williams doing his own thing, C.S. Lewis, Tolkien, but it would be. Um, it would be Barfield who's who's really kind of staking his flag on the fact that the mystics are going to be kind of poets at that point, right? Because to Lindsay's point about like heaven just being so out there, you know, we can we can we can have the word mystic, I suppose, but right now it's all kind of ethereal, just like the word heaven. That um, that we could say the church will be poetic, or it'll be um, nothing. Mute. <laughs> well, yeah, and so what we need is like cultivation practices. But when we say yes. mystic, everybody just wants this light to be, and they're a mystic. Well, right? and, I, and I think I think there is good critique about that. I think, and as someone who's had uh, exper- mystical experiences in my life before, there there is, I think, a a, a logical suspicion is that some, eventually some people only chase the mystical experience like a high. Right. And I think yeah. that that is dangerous because there are other. You know, you can some of the, some of the saints even had you know one massive encounter it never right. happened ever again so you're not you're gonna stop living your life because you're you know you know longing for us this this one instance life continues keep keep going so I, I think right. there there is I think the mystic, mystical as a as unmediated experience I think is really important in Christianity and I think that the like you know Meister Eckhart and Teresa of Avila are really, really the, the ecstasy of that interaction, I think is poignant. And I, it goes, I think it gets lost sometimes, but I also understand their suspicion of don't get too lost in the transcendent because we need you here. If you get, you know, and this happens even in the Eastern traditions, you have these sadhus who can't function because they're so, you know, somewhere else that they're no longer truly embodied. The whole point of the Christian story is that we incarnate here to bring spirit heaven here. So. And, and I think to move back a little bit, if we, we talk about the, the problem and this is a, you know, I, I, I sorry if I'm pushing the envelope. <laughs> I've certainly seen this in the last four years. You know, the the major problem Christianity writ large is facing right now, institutional Christianity, is that like the Fisher King, it is impotent. Yes. Right. And it need and 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 that's what it need not be. It need not be, but it is, right? And this is why I think um this the intuition of Novalis and of Goethe um, was spot on that is the, the divine feminine that will lead her, lead us ever onward and I think th- and I've been I'm I've been going on about this for a while now but uh, that's the importance of Sophia of Sophia. Let me bring up for a few minutes then this distinction as I was reading your article and everybody should read it. Mike's on Michael's on Christian romanticism and I I don't claim to 
be trying to like muck up the gears. But, you know, um, quite often the Catholic Church, the, the church is seen, uh, it's a very Marian image. You know, and we're talking about the divine feminine and you have people like this great Protestant theologian, Peter Leithart. Uh, it's, it's, in, it's implied in Bill Kavanaugh's work we had on a couple of weeks ago. But um, some people could say against Christianity for the church, you know, that um, just as we don't see heaven, you know, in the gospels as much, you know, we got some reference to a, a place with many, a mansion with many rooms. And so that's about it. But we don't see, we don't see Christianity talked about. We knew that people belonged to an ecclesia. Now for William Blake, I was kind of researching this question prior to this. So I was thinking of it when reading your article, Mike, and I'm not talking about just the Roman Catholic church, but young people, we can all use that as a, as a touchstone. We were talking about the absence of love, you know, but we know they're leading with this desire for a real authentic community too, you know, and the language of Christianity, the next Christianity, whether it's Novalis or you or anybody else, it's not problematic, but I, I know we're going to gain something by talking about the church too. So for William Blake, the church was all those people, you know, he'll say, I think this is North of Fry on William Blake. You know, he didn't condemn Pilate, and Pilate but he did condemn the barren fig tree, right? So for William Blake, we have to, when we're thinking about him, it's all like, are you creative? Are you a visionary? And so the church for him is what I would call circle two. It's that final movement of the symphony. When Lila or Lindsay and all her Lindsayness and Michael and all his Michaelness, we feel a higher oneness that makes the womb almost seem alienating, right? right. So we're yearning for that. But what is the church here today? Because, um, the language of Christianity usually does in the history of the church lead to sectarianism. Um, you know, but what, how would you guys bring discourse of the church into what you're thinking? Well, Lindsay's the, punting. The original Lindsay, subtitle. first time you punted all day. The, the <laughs> I'm, I'm considering um, it's, you yeah. know, I don't have the history of, of experience in the church. And as the two of you do, yeah, I've, yeah. I've been very much an outsider going, this has been my thing is like if it's doing the thing it's supposed to do why isn't it working because we're not in it it gets back to your idea of what are we going to do <laughs> what are we going to do right we're yeah, not right. in it so it's, it's, i don't it's know like, it's, it's, if it's, it's not working if well, we're not in it yeah well you know what the thing is the, that, go ahead this, sorry michael this begs the question of what do you mean by the church right True. and so, that's a good so, point too and yeah. my what is the church my that's interpretation that's blake's is of, not the traditional catholic notion of the church you know blake no he he is in moving this way he's a christian romantic he's not saying it's this thing where you take the sacraments it's all these visionaries and creative artists finding it's that oneness they find in creating a culture when mike martin is doing his jam and, and somebody else weaves in Lindsay's nice rock you know her bass my, my nice rock ballads yeah. yeah i mean i think i think for blake though the idea of perceiving the world in a different in a new way is paramount it's nice about you because you're yes he does harp on the importance of visionaries but it's the fact that visionaries have a way of seeing that others don't see and it's it's i think that's kind of like yeah. even even christ kind of you know wails on his disciples can't you and they're got to the, you know they're afraid like, don't you see yet can't you perceive what i'm talking about yet right. and then they're kind of just that they, they you know even even at the cross they disperse mm -hmm. you know who, who's there left john right. and the women mm -hmm. Well, you know, so, a few weeks ago, I church. was in Washington. I was in Washington D.C. with Spencer Clavin and like Paul, Paul Vanderclay. Yeah. And Paul, <laughs> he's a he's a Calvinist pastor, and he's he always talks about the church, right? He loves the church. Yeah. But I know, and he would. He, I don't think he would argue with me that when he says the church, he means something very different from the mystical when I body. The, the mystical church. body. Yeah. Right. I agree. Say the church. I mean. In, and where two or more gather in my name that's the church yeah. yeah so and 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 i think and i i think there has been untold damage throughout history from people associating the church with the bureaucrats running things oh horribly Agreed. right I, I know every bureaucrat would admit that much too you know remember again for illich he would say the church is that entity that takes its nourishment from the Eucharist. You know, that's a very mystical notion. Like that idea. It's great. But, but I, I think bureaucra bureaucracy often trumps that. It does. Yeah. yeah. And it, that, and that's the problem. And that's what, and that's what I, th you know, part of what really pissed me off over the past four years when the bishop said, okay, we're going to lift the Sunday obligation because we can. And then they said, okay, we'll put it back in now. I'm like, 
What do you mean? This kind of putting it back it. on was right. so funny. It was just like come on, who they had to be looking at their calendar, saying, "Okay, the oh, obligations." Well, it was just so funny. That's all it takes. Yeah. So you, why, why, you know? So why don't you? Uh, we were talking. Well, about I, I was actually. Stuff. I was actually quite sorry. A woman I know, her husband left, or I don't know if he left her, but he he was Chinese, but Catholic, and he had mistresses all over the place oh, wow. and she left him and she, but because they were married in the church and this has been over 50 years later, she has never remarried. So she's, and she's a good Catholic who won't remarry because of that, but she was condemned to a life of isolation because of, of, of a protocol. I mean, when, but that's, when on her, started, that's on her though, isn't it? You know, she could file for the annulment. They're now free in every diocese. But they wouldn't give her. No, they, okay. they don't Okay, do that's it, right? very important. They, that's very important. They give annulments, you know. Are they easy to get? <laughs> they are now. Pope Francis, it was, Pope for Francis, uh, he made it really, in one sense, easy. You know, it's... Wow. It's, um, but... It yeah, has, I'm not saying all this is, like, so clear. It's a whole different conversation. Right? <laughs> but, but even, even when I was... When, when COVID began, I was still in, like, my... I was very deep in my Orthodox inquiry phase. And I was talking to, you know, I was starting to go to an Antioch um, church and stuff like that. And my, my little girl at the time who was like almost six, she loved the music. She was, and she asked to go after when COVID shut down, she's like, mom, can we go back and listen to where the God music is? She That's loved, cool. she loved that. But I literally was in the beginnings of like, just beginning the inquiry stuff and talking to the, 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 the pastors and stuff there and everything shut down. And they told basically completely said, they go, said, go listen to ancient faith radio. And that's all that I got. I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, so. Oh yeah, Give they me a drop the ball in such a big way. <laughs> yeah, you know, like I, you know, I, I was, I was, I had been studying orthodoxy for almost two years. I was like ready. I was like really chopping the bit. I'm just gonna do this thing, and then all of a sudden it's evaporating. Because I think I guess that's not my place. Okay, good to know. God that's will take me someplace else. That's a story, Lindsay. It evaporated. Yeah. All right. Well, we should probably wrap it up. Oh, this has been day. great. Yeah. Uh, oh, by God. the way, look at that regeneration swag. I wish I I have one. Oh, I have a mug. swag. Yeah, so uh by the way we do have a patreon now so it's going to be in the in the box below uh, and i think mike's going to link my article on christian romanticism so, oh, well. and here's the thing Lindsay, do you have a website or anything can you send me any links to your i don't things? i don't have anything right now i mean the, the the i am currently trying to build out a um basically a, a collection of metaphysical fairy tales for kids and that's kind wow. of what no matter fairy tales is going to be and um, um, hopefully I'll be, I'll, I'll do an illustration or two here and there, but it, it's just been a, 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 as you know, summer gets away from you. Yeah. So it's still yeah. forthcoming, but that, that is the intention. But, um, if they want to see my work, I will be in Jesus, the imagination and the new, okay. um, That's great. In the new edition coming out. Yeah. And please, ladies and gentlemen, comment, subscribe, let us know what you think. I love, like, we love to come. Michael, I told you I had a, a friend of the podcast and a friend of yours, Scott Martin and his wife, uh, Avanessa, or Anessa, I'm sorry, Anessa. Anessa. They were they were coming from Michigan over to the uh, the St. Cattery Shrine and the uh, North American Martyr Shrine. Then they, they got off throughway I-90, kind of came through some of the Finger Lakes and showed up in center of the world, Axis Mundi, Hemlock, New York. And we had a, a really great afternoon. Yeah. yeah. Scott, Scott knows his plants and trees. And it's ecology like nobody, man. That's right. And Scott actually used to be in our CSA. And he yeah. was not far away at all. Scott, you left one of the T's in your first name in my yard. Scott spells his name S-C-O-T. Yeah, I know. He yelled at me because I, I, I put it in Jesus' imagination with two T's once. And I never going to it down. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well. It's not my fault. <laughs> yeah, but thank you, everybody, for listening to the Regeneration Podcast. Lindsay, I don't know too many things, and I can't read the future, but the future certainly has you on the Regeneration Podcast many more I'd times. I'd love to. Yeah, great, I'd love great. to. Thank yeah. you, guys. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and we will see you next week or thereabouts. Bye.